him there. Well, congratulations. You folks are at the top of your class. You were organized enough to handle the time change and get here. You're the high achievers. So, good to see you all here today. When the fasten seatbelt sign comes on, it either means uh, you're taking off, or you're landing, or you're experiencing turbulence. In the case of uh, taking off, you, you know about that. Case of landing, you've gone through that. But in mid-flight, when the fasten seatbelt sign comes on, you really don't know what is going on. And when the captain turns off the seatbelt sign, there's kind of a collective Ever since 9-11, for us as a nation, the captain has turned on the fastened seatbelt times multiple times. We've had a terror alert system, red, orange, or yellow. Uh, we don't know when the terror will hit, but we have a pretty good idea it will. We live on edge. And with the upcoming election, it seems like our country is in chaos. It could be that your fastened seatbelt sign has come on for you personally. You may lose your job. Your marriage is in trouble. The doctor shared with you a troubling diagnosis. Whatever the case, like on the plane, we are out of control. Actually, let me tell you, we never were in control. And when the reality of the situation is starting to face us personally and nationally, it's frightening. The good news is that God gives us some advice on how to live in uncertain times. Much of what we find in the Bible was written to people who were living in uncertain times. The Bible is not filled with feel-good messages for a world that we don't relate to. Uh, this is a book about how God is very much in control and we are not. We don't like uncertainty. We say, I don't want to fasten my seatbelt. Uh, I want the turbulence to go away. I don't want to be taken through it. I want to be led around it. I want to find something in the Bible that will guarantee my safety and terrorism. And Jumpstart the economy again and cure cancer. Where are those verses? You say, well, I've prayed for all these things, but I don't find many answers. Uh, who hasn't known the experience of unanswered prayer? Uh, you pray for a family member to get well and they pass away. You go in for a routine exam only to find that you have a tumor. All our dreams that we took for granted, that we will watch our kids grow up and get married and we'll live together and, you know, we'll die when we're good and ready. All that begins to go out the drain when we realize, I may not be here. We pray for God to give us a baby, but we're still childless. We ask God to get us a job, but we're still unemployed. We plead for God to get our parents back together, but they still get a divorce. We pray for the suicide bombings to stop, but they seem to get worse. Why does nothing change when God has promised... In James 5, 15, prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And how about Jesus? Is he leveling with us when he says in Mark eleven twenty three 23 to 24, you know, pull out your Bible today. I realize we don't have PowerPoint and uh, there's Bibles in front of you. You could use your phone if you want. But this is Mark eleven twenty three 23 to 24. Jesus says, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. You say, hey, I've prayed with my whole heart, but still it wasn't answered. I mean, what's the deal? When the fastened seatbelt sign comes on, does God answer our prayer or not? We will never have all the answers to an unanswered prayer, but the Apostle John takes us a long way toward unraveling the mystery in the book of 1 John. This is the ninth and final message in our series, The Real Thing. 
We've been asking, what is the real thing when it comes to following Christ? And John, one of Jesus' disciples, has answered that question in the book of 1 John. I love his answer because it's so simple. He distills it all down to three things. He says, the real thing is to, see if you can say it with me, to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. All right, let's try it a little more robust. The real thing is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, love people. Well, we can get our arms around that. That's simple. Jory always says, I love the book of 1 John. It is so, you know, you can get your arms around it. Now John finishes this book with one more thing. He wants us to wrap our belief, obedience, and love in prayer. He shows us how we can pray with confidence. In our text today... John makes some of the most amazing promises about prayer in all the Bible. So turn with me to 1 John 3, 21, and then hold your finger the next page over, 1 John 5, 14. Let's stand in honor of God's Word, and I'd like you to read with me. If you have, if you're using the Bibles that are in the seats, we'll all be reading the same thing. If yours is a little different, just speak out boldly, we'll be all right. 1 John 3, 21 to 22. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. Now flip over to 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Lord Jesus, one more time, we ask you to be our teacher. We thank you for teaching us throughout this series as we've asked what is the real thing. And now as we look at how can we pray with confidence, we want to do that. Uh, speak to us. We are so ready to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. John makes some promises about prayer that are every bit as amazing as Jesus promises about prayer. He says we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask. Then he says if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of Him. He too says that we'll receive whatever we ask. This confuses us all the more because we know, everybody here knows, we've asked for something that was not answered. So what's the deal? Does God answer our fasten the seatbelt prayers or not? John says God does. John says you can pray with confidence. But God doesn't answer just any prayer. God's promises concerning prayer are not meant to lead us to believe that we can ask whatever we want just by flipping a switch, pulling a lever. John tells us there are two conditions we must meet to pray with confidence. Uh, to better understand how to pray with confidence, we need to pull together both Jesus' teaching in the Gospels and John's teaching here in 1 John. Jesus tells us, whatever you ask in prayer, this is Mark eleven twenty four. 24, believe that you've received it and it will be yours. Does John mean if we have enough faith, we can expect immediate results every time we pray? Not necessarily. Although John, uh, Jesus teaches that God always answers prayer when we pray with faith, this isn't the only truth we need to grasp. John adds, this is 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of Him. God doesn't grant anything we ask simply because we believe. Just because I believe I'm going to be the greatest tennis player in the world or the greatest golfer doesn't mean I'm going to compete with Novak Djokovic or Jordan Spieth. Only when we know that what we pray for is in God's will can we be certain we'll receive it. Now, let's put Jesus and John's words together. Then we'll have the whole truth. If we know that what we pray for is in God's will, and if we pray with complete faith, we will receive what we ask. John's letter helps us understand 
John's gospel. Jesus is telling us the truth when he tells us that God will answer prayer offered in faith. But from John we learn that we cannot pray with complete faith that God will answer unless we know that what we're praying for is in God's will. Make sense? So here's the first condition for complete confidence when we pray. Our request must be in God's will. Now this may help us understand why sometimes when we pray for healing, it's not answered. Many people have prayed to be healed. We've prayed for family members to be healed and then they die. Well, turns out it's not always God's will to heal. Apostle Paul said, would you please heal me? You know what God answered? No. My grace is sufficient for you. Uh, a current faith healer uh, admitted that only 10% of the cases that come to him for prayer are actually healed. So not everybody's healed when they pray for healing. We should always ask for healing, but we cannot be certain that that's God's will. That's going to bring him the most glory for the person to be healed. Sometime back, I conducted a, multi, uh, a, a memorial service for a man who died after a two-year battle with cancer. We prayed many times for him to be healed. Gathered the family, prayed for him. A couple days after the memorial service, the wife came to see me and she said, you know, I'm very, very sad that he's gone. But I do have to admit, I think God may have received more glory in his death than in his life. He said, you see, he was very quiet about his faith. Like most American, most American Christians today, kind of keep our heads down, don't talk about it. He was that way. But when he got sick, he began to speak out about Jesus Invite people to church. He figured, what do I have to lose? And his quiet serenity in dealing with his cancer was a, a glimmer of light to people, and people watched him. And so his wife said, I think he got more glory that way. People came to faith. So... If we don't always know if it's God's will for us to pray for healing, what can we pray for with absolute assurance that's in God's will? His peace. Uh, John 20, 21, Jesus said, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you uh, to meet our needs. John, uh, Philippians 4, 19, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. So you have a need, not a want, a need, promises to meet it. To be with us, Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You can pray with confidence for God to be with you, to provide us an escape from temptation. You're dealing with something. You just keep getting tempted over and over again and giving in, and you're so frustrated. Here's a promise, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That's a promise. And when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Do you know every time you're tempted, there's a little escape route? Got to look for it. It's always there. The ability to love your wife or submit to your husband. Ephesians 5.22, wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. You can pray that with absolute confidence. That's a promise from God. Wisdom, you need direction on what you should, should I go this way or that way? If any of you, this is James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Although we know it's God's will for all people to know him, God loves everyone, he wants everyone to know him, we also know that God does not force his will on us. He will not force anybody to spend eternity in heaven with him. This aspect of God's will frustrates us. We pray for our family members to come to Christ and they seem to go further. We pray for friends that we so much want them to come to know Jesus and they don't seem to be interested. You should keep praying, but you also have to know that God will not force his will. He will not manipulate. He gives them perfect freedom. Keep praying. 
but he won't take away their freedom. Maybe understanding, let me give you an example of a prayer in the Bible. We'll look at the Hebrews in Exodus. Exodus 2, 23 says, the people of Israel cried out, Lord, deliver us from bondage to the Egyptians. How long did it take for God to answer that prayer? 400 years. You say, oh, that's encouraging. My prayer will be answered in 400 years. What we learn from this, and they're waiting, might help us next time we're struggling with unanswered prayer. We learn that sometimes when we pray, God's will is for things to get worse before they get better. They got decidedly worse for the Hebrew people. In Exodus 5, Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go. Uh, Pharaoh didn't respond, oh, I'm sorry about that injustice among your people. I'll get the paperwork started right away to ex ex expedite their release. No, he said, I'll take away their straw. They still have to make bricks, but we're not going to give them any materials. Things got worse. We may pray for our children to follow Christ, and they seem more determined to go the other way. We pray for uh, God to deliver a friend from addiction and the person seems to go deeper into that addiction. Maybe God knows that they will, he will not get the most glory until they hit rock bottom. We become frustrated or resentful, perhaps even stop praying in these situations because we think we're supposed to pray and God's supposed to answer and it's supposed to be smooth. Sometimes when we pray, God brings more difficulty into our lives. He uses adversity to deepen our character, to teach us patience. That's what happened with the Hebrew slaves. We learn from the Hebrew slaves that God received more glory by them waiting. God's power wasn't absent. God's power is all over the book of Exodus. There were all those miracles. But it was a duel between God and Pharaoh. Moses announces to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go. And the slave drivers announced Pharaoh's answer. This is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go get your own. But your work will not be reduced at all. Well, whose word is going to stand? Next we see the battle of the dueling snakes. Moses strikes his staff, or Aaron strikes the staff, and, they, and they, all these snakes appear on the platform, and Pharaoh's unimpressed. He asks his magicians, and they do the same thing. But then Moses' snakes ate up all of Pharaoh's. And people worshipped the cobra in Pharaoh as a god. And their gods just got eaten. Showed that God is greater then there was the Battle of the Dueling Deities. Uh, the, the plagues are not just special effects that Hollywood uses to spice up the story. You know, the Ten Commandments. They are various gods that the people in Egypt worship. They believe that Hopi protected the Nile, so God turned the Nile into blood. They believe that Ray was the god of the sun, so God had things go dark. Pitch black in Egypt. They believe Pharaoh was incarnate, so God took his first son. Pharaoh's son. They believed that Pharaoh's power was unstoppable. So his army was drowned in the Red Sea. By the time he was done, Pharaoh could see, and all the people of Egypt could see, that God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, was the one true God, and not all these gods of Egypt that they worshipped. That's why many Egyptians went out with them. Uh, unanswered prayer doesn't mean God is impotent. There's nothing we can ask that God doesn't have the power to accomplish. God's will is usually determined by what brings him the most glory. And ultimately, God received great glory after all these miracles and the people went out. Many Egyptians became believers and Pharaoh had to admit this was the real God. Helen Roser 
was a uh, missionary doctor in Congo for 20 years. Her fourth year there, a woman was giving birth to a baby and, uh, the, and the mother died, leaving behind a premature baby and a two-year-old sister. So the first task was to keep this little infant warm. And so she sent the uh, midwife to get a hot water bottle. Midwife came back and said, I got bad news. I filled it up, but the water bottle broke. And worse yet, there aren't any more. That was the last one. So the doctor said, all right, you sleep, you sleep close to the baby. Keep the baby warm tonight. We'll figure this out tomorrow. And the solution was not easy. They are out in the middle of the jungle. In the, this is Congo. And uh, help was many miles away. And about noon, uh, the doctor was explaining to the children, this is an orphanage, and uh, that, you know, pray for this little baby, premature. And we need a hot water bottle. And to keep the baby warm. He's got two little uh, sad, you know, two-year sister. And so Ruth, one of the orphans, a 10-year-old, took the matter to heart. And she said, God, bring us a hot water bottle this afternoon. I mean, tomorrow will be too late. The baby will be dead. And while you're at it, bring a, a doll for the sister so she'll know she's loved too. Well, the, the doctor was just stunned. She knew that the only way that prayer could be answered would be like a, a parcel coming from the States. And she'd been there four years and never received one package. But in the afternoon, a 22-pound package arrived. And she started to cry. She said, could this be it? She gathered the kids around and took off all the you know, brown paper. And they went in and it's all these... You know, doctor supplies, bandages and medicines and T-shirts and raisins. And, and there it was, a hot water bottle. And then she gets way down to the bottom of the box. There's this little doll. This package was sent weeks before the request. Little Ruth's prayer brought God great glory. It was in his will because it brought him glory. You can pray with confidence. If you ask for something that will bring God glory, more than likely it's in God's will. John gives a second condition for praying with confidence. This is 1 John 3.21. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Here's the second condition. Our life must be lived in obedience to God's will. The second condition is the second mark of the real thing, obedience to Jesus. Now imagine if I asked Jamie, our senior in high school, goes to Lincoln to clean the kitchen. And she says no, and as she walks off and slams her bedroom door. Now this is strictly hypothetical. Nothing like this would ever happen in our home. <laughs> and then maybe a half hour later, she comes down and asks, Dad, can I use the car? Would that be a good time for her to ask for the car? I mean, she probably would intuitively know <laughs> not the right time to ask Dad for something, right? Well, the psalmist says, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean if we sin, God doesn't hear us? How does God hear the prayer of a sinner? God always hears our prayers. So what does that verse mean? I think the verse means that we intuitively know when we've sinned that we're not right with God. Not a good time to be asking for favors, right? So what do we do? Mostly because we're proud and don't confess easily, we just don't bring God any favors. We intuitively know it's not, it's not going to work. Am I right? I think that's what the verse means. Isaiah says the same thing. Isaiah 59, 2. Your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. Come on, is God deaf? He can't hear our prayers? 
I think it's the same thing. It's not that God can't hear. It's that our sin separates us from God, rupturing our intimate relationship with God, and we intuitively know, I can't ask God because of what I just did, and so we don't ask. God has determined that certain expressions of his power will only be exercised in response to prayer. God helped Sam find his watch because Sam humbled himself to say, God, I don't know where my watch is. Help me find it. One of the greatest tragedies of life is that prayers go unanswered because prayers go unasked. God won't do it unless you pray it. When our prayers are unanswered, we're prone to wonder, hey, God, what's the deal? Have you forgotten me? What's wrong with God? Why won't he give me a break? Not many people are willing to take an honest look inside and say, you know, is the reason my prayers aren't being answered is because of something going on in me? My attitude, the way I'm acting? And maybe those very things are keeping you from praying to God. You kind of know there's some unfinished business between you and God. Young children danced in the downpour. Parents looked up in the sky and let the rain drop off of their parched lips and they opened their mouths to receive it. When it hasn't rained in a long time, rain is like diamonds falling from the sky. That's exactly what happened in Israel, first century B.C., the generation before Jesus. It hadn't rained for over a year, not a drop, and it seemed a whole generation was going to pass away. It had been four centuries since there had been a prophet in Israel. There weren't any more miracles, and people wondered if God was still there. Everybody except Hani, an old sage who lived outside of Jerusalem. People weren't sure if God could hear them, but Hani was sure that God could hear them. And so one day, Hani came to the town center, and he had a staff about six feet long, and he drew a circle, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, 360 degrees, put down his staff, and then he knelt down. And he prayed like the prophet Elijah who called down fire from heaven. He prayed for God to send rain. He said, God, Lord of mercy, almighty God, I will not leave this circle until you show mercy on your people. A shudder went up the spines of the people who heard that. Thousands had now gathered around. They were shocked with the boldness of his prayer, the confidence. And it wasn't just the loudness of his voice, it was the, the tone of his voice. He was humble but confident. And then it began to happen. Raindrops parachuting down and a gasp went up through the crowd as they saw the rain and they started dancing. And Hophni never, Hani never looked up. He said, not for a rain like this have I asked, but for rain that fills cisterns and caves and pits. And suddenly a torrential rain came down and people said the drops were as big as eggs. They filled the streets so quickly people ran for the Temple Mount to get away from the flash flood. And Hophni was still in his circle and he refined his prayer once again. He says, God, not for a prayer like this have I asked, but a prayer of your favor, your graciousness. And the rain settled down. About like this, folks. <laughs> we see it almost every day. 
for six months of the year. An easy, soft rain. They called it the day. That's how it was remembered. Before that day, hardly anybody could believe in God. After that day, nobody could not believe in God. Hani was an obedient prophet. Therefore, he could boldly ask God for rain. And you can pray with confidence. So, if we pray for things that we know are in God's will, and we seek to obey God, John says we can pray with confidence. Now, how can we put this into pro- uh, practice? If you get just one thing today, get what I'm going to say now. I want to make this very practical for you. Anders Ericsson did a study about a decade ago at the Berlin School of Music. They took the violinists and divided them into groups. The expert, superb violinists, the very good violinists, and then the more average violinists, ones that probably would not go on to play professionally. They studied their practice habits, and they found that most of them had pretty much the same routine until they were about eight years old. Practiced about the same. At age eight, their patterns, practice patterns diverged. And they found by the age of 20, the average violinist had practiced about 4,000 hours. The very good violinist had practiced about 8,000 hours. And the expert, superb violinist had practiced 10,000 or more hours. Now, their study did not suggest that innate abilities don't matter, you know, and how well we can perform, but they said the magic bullet was 10,000 hours. Apparently, it takes that long for your brain to assimilate what you need to know and be able to do to be superb at any discipline. And they said this just this doesn't have just to do with violin. It could be piano or football or, you know, basketball, golf, tennis, figure skating, you know, whatever. Any level of sport, they found that 10,000 hours is about what it takes to be excellent, professional, star caliber. Now, is prayer any different? Prayer is a practice we have to learn how to do. It's a skill that we can develop. You know, you're not born with an innate ability to pray. So, here's my practical suggestion. However you wake up in the morning, by your phone, maybe put a post-it or a note or on the mirror somewhere, pray. Pray before your day gets rolling. Praise God, confess your sins, pray for the people in your life, pray through your day, pray for some significant other people, and uh, make this a practice. If we're going to pray with confidence, we need to pray, and we need to pray a lot if we're going to get really good at this. The more you pray, the more you will learn to pray for things that are in God's will and to live in obedience to God's will. And that's how you will learn that you can pray with confidence. Okay? Father, uh, thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for teaching us today, and we all have fastened seatbelt signs come on in our lives, and we all have times when we desperately need to pray, but help us to pray all the time and become good at it, become experts in prayer, knowing how to pray in your will, and knowing how to live our lives in obedience to your will, so that we can pray with confidence. So, okay, I want you right now, your head's still bowed, uh, to, to pray. Take the biggest problem in your life, the one that you want to pray about the most right now, and try to pray for it 
as best as you can in God's will. What you think would bring him glory, be in his will. Pray for that that way. And then before, you might have to confess something. Maybe there's something in the way in your relationship to God that you've got to get rid of so you can pray. Give you all a moment to pray. Lord God, thank you that you give us prayer. You give us the opportunity to talk to you, the great creator of this universe, and you've got great power and you love us so much, but you don't just give us things. You ask and insist that we pray. That opens up your power to us. So thank you and help us learn how to be these 10,000 hour type prayers who are experts. In Jesus' name we pray.